Zoe Young is our first reader. Zoe Young's fiction investigates the subset of people for whom making art is a basic human need. Her work explores the intersections between art practice and mental illness, profession and obsession, and the often indistinguishable line between making art and living it. Let us welcome Zoe Young. We're ready for a reading. <laughs> Gloria, thank you for that introduction. And thank you so much for your speech and your words on truth. So, also, that's what happens when you give burlesque dancers MFAs. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank my mentors, Rebecca Bloyd, Anita Armerizvani, Donna De La Perriere, Tanya Foster, and last but certainly not least, John Lasky, my grand Faulkner. <laughs> This book would not have happened without you. Um, thank you to the Finishing School Writers Group, my North Star, my spectacular cohort, and the best family and group of friends a person can ask for. We are all Starbarf. <laughs> the scene I'm about to read is one of the only instances of nonfiction in my novel, and it fits very well with Gloria's remarks. Though set in Brownsville, Brooklyn, the following is based on events that took place just a stone's throw from this very auditorium. Right. The door of the shack was ultramarine. Ryan knew it was ultramarine because he'd chosen that color over, over cobalt at Utrecht two days earlier. It was a piece of plywood hung between two tarps as part of a three-walled shelter. The fourth wall was the side of a warehouse. The door had been painted with fingers, small fingers, he thought and Rye imagined the hand to which those fingers belonged breaking the lock on his studio door. Rye was sure he knew the culprit personally. Now four years living in Brownsville, he was on a first name basis with every junkie on the block. Brownsville was a shithole and so was Rye's studio, AKA his apartment, but it was supposed to be that way. Dirt cheap rent is necessary for some artists and some junkies, and Rye conceived of the situation as a sort of misery cooperative with some potentially important side effects. The artists have to live in shitholes to afford to make art. The junkies have to live in shitholes to afford to buy junk. The artists end up making art about their shithole homes, i.e. their neighbors, the junkies. But here's the twist. People who can afford to live outside the artist junkie neighborhood buy the art and think about the junkies. <laughs> the problem is, they don't tell you that one day, one or more of your junkie neighbors will break into your studio and steal eight new tubes of oil paint that cost $31.50 plus tax. The cadmium red was an even $50, a gut punch. Rye could not replace that paint, not if he wanted to pay rent, which he did. But more than that, he wanted to make the painting he'd been planning, the painting that had been commissioned and would pay his rent long into the future. The break-in hadn't felt like getting mugged. Getting mugged makes sense. The street belongs to the mugger, and once you tread upon it, your wallet becomes their property. But coming home to find your house half torn apart is different. It doesn't sweep your legs out from under you. It takes the floor. Rye knocked on the blue door. Metal clinked on metal, and somebody said, God damn it. Nothing happened. He knocked again. More noise. This time it sounded like someone walking on paper. Then one of the tarps parted, not the newly painted door, and a gaunt old man said, Well, hello. Rye had no idea what to do. Hi, he said. I'm Henry, the old man said too eagerly. He put out his hand. Rye shook it. What else was he going to do? He noticed a smudge on Henry's knuckles that was either a bruise or an ancient point-and-stick tattoo. I'm Rye. Rikers! 
came a gravelly woman's voice from inside the shack. You know him? The old man asked. Yeah, lives up the block. Then come in, come in, Henry said. So Rye did. Henry held out the tarp for him to crouch under. Looking into the shack was like looking into a geode. Pieces of CDs stacked on crumpled newspaper inserts, leaning towers of soup cans overflowing with God knows what, broken bits of shiny things, unrecognizable as anything but magpie mortar. The woman who had spoken sat cross-legged in the midst of the piles, with her hands in the matted hair of a third man laying face down in her lap. Rye recognized her. She lifted a hand from the man's head and waved. Rye waved back. Hi, Jules, he said. The smell of human musk was a marine layer under the sun-baked tarps. What's going on, Rikers? Were these people gaslighting him? The door was blue. They must know why he was there. Not much, Rye said. He looked across the shack at a pile of milk crates serving as shelves, and there, next to a chipped glass pipe, was his impasto mat medium, the thick, colorless substance that turns less paint into more paint. Hey, Rye said, pointing at the tube. You mind if I take a look at that? Sure thing, Henry handed it to him like he was passing Rye a lighter. What's wrong, Jules asked. Somebody broke into my place. Rye was utterly at sea. Oh, that's too bad, Henry said. What's the damage? They took some paint. Rye held up the tube. It had been opened, but he could, still, he could feel it was still mostly full. Oh, glad you could get it back, Henry said. <laughs> Rye was so confused he couldn't speak. What else they take, Jules asked. He was staring at her with his mouth open. Rikers, what else they take? Just the paint, he said. Seven more tubes. That's it? If it was me, I'd have jacked the toilet paper first thing. Rye hadn't taken inventory of his toilet paper. <laughs> it, it wasn't you? Not us, Henry said. Then the head in Jules lap spoke. Have him check the cart. Yeah, look in the cart, Jules said. It's outside. Might be some in there. Rye made to push open the door. Use the tarp, Henry yelled. On the sidewalk was a wooden cart on casters with a dirty stuffed animal crushed under one of the wheels to keep it from rolling away. Rye dug past cans, bottles, an orange cone, dog leashes until he found three paint tubes on the cart's sticky bottom. Cadmium yellow, magenta, and burnt umber. The, bur the burnt umber had been punctured halfway down the tube, but he could just throw some duct tape on it if that hadn't been stolen too. The paints had all been opened, but like the impasto, they were mostly full. He rummaged through the cart until he was sure he'd seen everything. Where's the rest? He yelled back at the shack. Just a minute, it was Henry. Rye went back under the tarp. It was really more of a fort now that he thought about it. His hands were sticky and black in places, but he now had four tubes cradled in his right arm. This is all I found. The scene inside the shack was exactly the same, except the face-down man's shirt was now off. I'm still out four tubes. Tell him to talk to Tony, the face-down man said. Go talk to Tony, Jules said. Rye addressed the back of the face-down man's head, sure this was his, feet, his thief. Did you give them to Tony? There was a pause, and the face-down man spoke again. Tell him to talk to Tony. Jules just looked at Rye this time. He lifted the tarp. Thanks for stopping by, Henry said. Then Rye heard the words, have a good day, escape his lips. They didn't have to tell him where Tony lived. Rye knew. Everyone within a five-block radius knew. Tony was homeless, he had Tourette's, and he lived on the street corner across from Rye's building. Tony's nightly barking was a sonar unto itself. Instead of drawing from the expected profanity thesaurus, Tony yelled nothing but Marlon Brando. Streetcar named Desire, the godfather, on the waterfront. Tony knew the whole Brando catalog. And it all came out in spurts like he was yelling at a small dog. Senator Corleone, President Corleone, cat shit Corleone. Every night. Rye could see Tony from his window, but there wasn't much to see. No tent, no cart, no sleeping bag, just an old man sitting on the sidewalk, screaming. Rye turned the corner, and naturally, Tony wasn't there. He walked down the street to his spot and inspected a big gulp full of something that definitely wasn't soda baking in full sun, half a newspaper, as in a newspaper literally ripped in half, and three tubes of oil paint lined up against the building in the thinning strip of shade, viridian green, zinc white, and the most precious, most necessary to the painting upstairs, cadmium red. Rye had given up on the ultramarine, but to find the rest of his paint here just waiting was unreal. Then came a new dilemma. 
whether or not he could steal his paints back. Tony wasn't his thief. The man could hardly walk, let alone break into an apartment, and at this point, Rye was sure the culprit had been the face-down man from the blue-doored shack. That meant Tony would have received the paints as a gift or traded for them, but what could he possibly want with oils? Rye stood there paralyzed on Tony's sidewalk, staring at the word zinc on his unopened tube of zinc white. He could see all three tubes were untouched. Rye couldn't move. He couldn't make himself tank the paint, and he couldn't make himself leave. And then something even stranger happened. Tony came back. He was shoeless, as usual, limping on his right leg, muttering something. He had nothing in his hands, but he seemed to be returning from an errand. He walked right past Rye and plopped down between the paint and the half newspaper. Rye stared at the top of his head for a long time. They were both in hot sunlight, notable because if Tony were to shift 270 degrees, the distance of a few feet to the building's effacing edge, he would have been in shade. Rye figured it was a show of loyalty to his spot. Tony took the tube of cadmium red from the sliver of shade and put it against the back of his neck. Of course, he was cooling the metal. The paint tubes were ice packs to him. After that, he seemed to notice Rye for the first time. You hot? Tony asked. Rye nodded. Tony handed him the zinc white. As he reached for it, Rye remembered he was holding four other tubes of paint and shifted them awkwardly, awkwardly to the crook of his arm. He took the white and held the tube against the back of his neck. It was nice. You can keep that, Tony said. His normal speaking voice wasn't nearly as rough as his yelling voice. I just need two, one on the neck and one in the shade. Where'd you get these, Rye asked. Tony pointed back down the block in the direction of the blue-doored shack. Hank brought him over. Rye assumed Hank was the face-down man. Then Tony put the cadmium red back down in the shade and picked up the viridian green and started rubbing the metal on his face. Just watching the word viridian move in circles across a surface, even Tony's cheek rocketed Rye back into the painting he had been planning. Forms like dark trees would shoot upward and support tangled ribbons of hot secondary colors. He saw his charcoal sketches, his color tests, the massive canvas he'd stretched. The only thing on it now was his underpainting, more of a suggestion than a map, because this painting wanted to be thick. These forms wanted to grow and erode and grow again. Tony, it's my paint, Rye said flatly. Tony hadn't heard him. He had the butt of the viridian tube in his eye. God damn it. Tony, Rye said. He looked up at him this time. They're my paints. Tony looked confused. What paints? Rye held out the zinc white. These. Oh, no, they're Hanks. Tony gave Rye a knowing smile, like he was helping him with a genuine misunderstanding. Hank took them from me, Rye said. Oh. Now Tony understood. He looked down at the sidewalk and put the viridian against his lips. Rye hated himself. Rye returned to his studio with all seven tubes of paint, too guilty to use them. He improvised a lock on his door with an old padlock and walked to the liquor store where he spent two of the five dollars he had for dinner on a battery-operated handheld fan. He gave it to Tony, who only said, thanks, brother, and turned it on immediately. That night, the usual Brando soliloquies poured forth from Tony's corner. Rye painted until sunrise with all seven colors, windows open because of the turpentine. He'd reordered the hues in his head so as not to need the ultramarine blue, and the painting grew steadily, methodically, and for the first time, Rye felt like he was painting with Tony. Dark angular forms rose from a red soup as Johnny was defeated by the road in the wild one. Rye mixed a bright green and added a thick glob of the impasto mat as Tony made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Rye took a stab at the first ribbon form. It felt like flying. They were having a conversation, he and Tony, half brando, half paint. At dawn, Tony shifted to the howled lines of a therapist that Rye would later recognize as belonging to a movie called Don Juan de Marco. Rye collapsed onto his mattress. The ribbons on the canvas were becoming the matted tangle of color he'd hoped for, and this was only the beginning. When Rye awoke, he went to visit Tony. They were friends now. He found him in his spot, the big gulp empty, and the little fan in pieces by his foot. What happened to your fan? Rye asked, unsure whether or not Tony recognized him. Must have broke it last night, Tony said. Sometimes I break things in the night. Thank you. <laughs>